All right, uh, we're gonna just dive right in. We're actually way behind. So without any further ado, I'd love you guys to give a warm welcome to our next panel about health. Please welcome Janica Alvarez from Naya Health, Deborah Anderson Bialis from Fertility IQ, Ida Tin from Clue, and our moderator, Sarah Burr. Big round of applause. Ladies, welcome to the stage. Uh, I would like to point out that this is the first time ever at TechCrunch Disrupt that we've been able to talk about women's reproductive health. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge subject that affects more than half the women in the world. Well, half the people in the world, excuse me. Half the people in the world, <laughs> mm -hmm. a little nervous on stage. Um, I wanna get right into this. Uh, why has it taken so long with all the health tech, with, with all the technology out there, why has it taken us so long? I'm just gonna scoot up here so I can see yeah. you. Um, why has it taken us so long to start looking at women's health <sighs> in the tech world? Ada, I'm gonna start with you. Well, that's a good question. I think, I think it makes a difference when you have that experience yourself in your body. And since there have been more men starting companies, maybe it just haven't been top of mind. So I think, when, as you know, there's more women becoming tech entrepreneurs, we're starting to address these things. Yeah, yeah, but this is not something, I mean, even though we're talking about women's reproductive systems, we're not actually talking about, this is not a women's thing, right? This, I mean, this, this should be something that affects this entire audience. This is I, and, and I something that's really, really important. And, and, um, and Deborah, you actually, I want to get right into your story because I think this illustrates this, uh, this point is that you and your husband uh, wanted to have kids, and then I'm gonna let you tell this story because I think it's extremely interesting. You're, you're in your mid-20s. Yeah, so I was in my um, early 20s when we got married, or mid-20s, and um, I wanted to actually look into egg freezing, thinking that I wanted to work on my career and maybe wanted to buy us some time to have kids. And what we, what we learned when we went in was I wasn't as fertile, neither of us were as fertile as we would have hoped. Um, and it kind of drove us down this path of trying to find the right doctor, trying to get good information about fertility, and there was just no great information but this is, I mean, out the there. doctors told you that you weren't as fertile as you had hoped, right? Yeah. And then, but, so you went through all these doctors yeah. and then didn't have success, spent tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we, we ended up at three different doctors. We did multiple rounds of IVF, didn't have success, ended up actually getting pregnant naturally, and we have a four-month-old. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we don't know as much about reproductive health as, uh, as we would hope. So this is what I find is so fascinating, is that we know so little about how to make a baby still. I was reading this. There's this hmm. old Atlantic article from, you know, maybe a year, a year or two ago about um, a woman who was really scared because she's in her later 30s and she's not sure if she can have a baby. And it turns out all the research she's, you know, been told, you know, she has a one in three chance. And it turns out it's research from like the 1600s right. France. <laughs> right. Right? This is what we're pulling data from. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're all looking at data. Uh, you're looking at, you know, breast pump data, you're looking at fertility, IVF doctors and data, and, and you're looking at, uh, you know, period tracking and ovulation cycles. Mm -hmm. what's, what's something that you found really interesting that we may not have known without actually looking at and tracking women's health? Well, I think, you know, in the breast pump and the feeding market, so this is something that I think it's been a pretty stagnant market, and it's actually a really big market. So if you combine breast pumps, bottles, and the nutrition market for both moms and babies, it's about an $80 billion opportunity. So one, I don't think people really talk about that. It hasn't been innovated on in about 30 years. And I think it's just the pressures that we're finding where more women are going back to work, right? So 64% of women in the workforce actually have an infant or a toddler at home that they're trying to care for. So then you have this growing workforce, right? You have all of this research going in around the benefits of providing breast milk, right? So not only for, for baby, but you also have a lot of benefits for mom, where she has a decreased incidence of ovarian cancer, breast cancer, et cetera. So I think it's just the awareness is growing. We have a lot of pressures as women going back to work. We want to feel good at work and feel confident, but we also want to be good at home and provide for our family. So I think it's a little bit of a mix between you know, the pressures, bringing awareness, et cetera, and then the market opportunity. But you've, but you've also 
uh, learned a few really interesting things about pumping at certain right. times of day and totally. something we never knew before. Yeah, so I, you know, getting to the data, I think that two things that we're interested in. So I think with the pump alone, what we can do is we can start tracking user behavior. So we know, you know how much mom pumps, when she pumps, and we can start informing her about how to best um, improve her experience. So when's the optimal time to pump? How does her lifestyle impact her milk production, right? This is something that 83% of women want to know and they want to automatically track that, right? On the flip, when you're using a bottle, which we have a bottle as well that's connected not only to our system but to other systems, we can also tell you when your baby's eating, how much your baby's eating. That becomes very interesting not only from a consumer behavior perspective but also in healthcare and preventative care. So I think that being able to just track these insights and then know that whatever insights we're actually producing and providing for families, it's actionable. So you can change your lifestyle to really improve your experience. Right, and also, I mean, as you're working, as you're going back into the workforce after having your baby, right. that's, that's fundamental. It's huge, and I think that what's interesting, and I, not a lot of women talk about this, but you know, 80% of women in the U.S. start breastfeeding, right? They start to, to at least expose their child to, to breast milk, and there's a steep decline once women go back to work, because there's not a lot of uh, accommodations in the workplace, right? So only um, half of women actually get accommodations. 25% of women go back to work within two weeks, right? Um, and I think that it's just we need better solutions and we need the data because without the data, we really don't understand our own behavior and how we can create a better solution. Yeah, Ida, you've, you're looking at not just women who are, who are pumping or men, women who are looking to get pregnant, you're looking at the full spectrum of every woman who's, you know, mm -hmm. currently having a period, not in menopause, not, you know. Um, what's something that you found that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. about period tracking? So, we recently saw that we can see when a woman is ovulating through her heart rate, which is pretty fascinating because that's one of the things that we can now measure in a variable. So it's very easy to get that data set. And if you put that together with a few other, few other data streams, you might come to a point where you can really enable a woman to take out her phone and she can see if it's the day she can get pregnant. And then you have a digital contraceptive, mm -hmm. which is obviously you know, a huge market opportunity in the world. So I think what I, one thing I, mean, I, but I don't I don't know. I, I don't know that I agree with that because I, I don't think any woman is going to be using an app to prevent pregnancy. I, well, we'll talk again. In I would be five very, years. I would be very afraid for her <laughs> She's using an app to, to prevent pregnancy. I actually think it depends. A lot of people right? already do it right. with, you know, we don't recommend that people use clue to get to avoid pregnancy without anything else. Right. But if you look at something like hormonal birth control, um, you know. Like we're talking about the rhythm method, basically. And, and that as well. I mean, the okay. thing is, people use data to understand birth control across the board, no matter what method you're applying. And I think when you have a, a system that you trust and that you know that the algorithm and the AI on top of it is so strong that you actually trust the predictions, you will know which stage you want to use a condom. Because you have to think, right now, it's about 30% who use the pill. So for a lot of women, you know, what else are they doing, right? There is such a hunger for new methods for family planning. It will come. It will come. It's just a matter of getting, you know, RA good enough. It's coming. And we have new sensor technologies popping up. You know, we might look at saliva or we might look at, you know, even breath. We're looking at into sensor technologies. So you put all these sensor technologies together with the ability to process the data, and you will have something that you can trust. We're not there yet. I wouldn't also not use it today. Like, I'm with you there, but it will come. I truly believe in that. OK, yeah. I mean, I personally would not use an app to prevent pregnancy. I think I would use contraceptives or a condom or something like that. But, no, um, no, you should definitely use a yeah. condom the days that you can't get pregnant. Otherwise, all of a you will become pregnant. <laughs> yeah. yes. what's, uh, what's something else? That you, you mentioned new technologies are coming down the road. What's something that you've seen that you think is very promising? Well, I'm really excited about the possibility of looking into the body on a molecular level combined with the things that we can track that are not kind of qualitative. Like how do I feel? What's my pain levels? What's my sex drive? Well, all these things. I think that's really what's exciting, putting the data streams of the kind of automated things into the more qualitative data sets that we already have. And I think you will start seeing things. And one of the things we can probably see is disease detection. We are not there yet. There's a lot of regulatory things we have to navigate. But we have done early studies, and we can see when people have patterns that look like something like PCOS or endometriosis, which many, many people suffer from, so that we can say, hey, maybe you want to go see a doctor and have this looked at.
What's the, what's the global market potential for period tracking? So the way I look at it is that data is going to change every single market within female health, right? We already see it in, in you know, your markets, and this is gonna, it's going to change every single market. And we have done some research, and we see that that combined is going to in, grow into a $200 billion annually addressable market. So I, and this is a huge market. And there's also a really huge market for IVF as, as, pe right. as couples are getting older and getting, you know, wanting to plan a family right. when they're older as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a million reasons that we're now getting, getting married older. I think we're older, wiser, more established. Um, unfortunately, it's not the way that biology wanted it to happen. Um, I think uh, in nature, we weren't at the peak of our careers during menopause. We were dead. So, um, yeah, I mean, right now there's a $3 billion uh, market just for IVF alone, not even counting all of the other fertility services. Mm -hmm. How do you plan to, you, you don't mo currently monetize, how do you plan to bring in money for, or do you have a plan to bring in money for yeah, Fertility we do. IQ? So, um, so today users come to the site, it's free. Eventually to access some of the deeper data that we have, we do believe users will pay a subscription. The average successful IVF patient spends $66,000 out of pocket. This is an enormous financial commitment, and Huge. so we do think they are, um, they have the appetite and they will be willing to pay for it. Yeah, how much do you think that, do you kind of have a sense of how much they're willing to pay for this information? You know, we're not sure where we'll price it yet, but I think the willingness to pay is very high. I don't think we're trying to maximize and go right up to their, to their willingness level. Um, this is the most important thing in people's lives, and uh, I think the willingness is very high. Do you worry that you're going to get into that kind of Yelp territory where people aren't sure if they can trust the reviews and they don't know what they're paying for? Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of funny. I think we see comparing what we do and Yelp as kind of comparing like Gawker and the New York Times. Like they both have online content, but are they the same thing? Um, so the reviews on our site um, are, first of all, they're not just kind of five stars in an open text box. People come and enter 80 data points about themselves who they are, their demographics, fertility history, and then very deep data about their, their actual treatment um, and their experience with that treatment. And, um, so, and, and also, we actually take the step to verify that the people who are submitting those reviews are real patients. So these aren't competitors, these aren't people from the clinic's marketing department, they submit documentation showing us. So uh, I, I'm not worried that the quality will, will get degraded. Yeah. You, you actually, Ida, you have a separate obstacle in that uh, people might be entering their data for maybe a month or two and then drop off. How do, you, how do you get people to come back for more after looking at insights for a little bit? So we actually have really high retention. We've, and, and I think we have, one of the things that we have work like going for us is that we have this monthly reminder coming all the time, right? We have like this biology helping our users to remind um, every month. And I think what's exciting about the female body is that we never really figure it out because from a woman have her first period through the last, there's all these events happening through life. You know, we try not to become pregnant, then we maybe want to become pregnant, maybe we have issues, go through pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, like we have conditions. So there's always something that we want to understand, questions that we have, and there's a lot of informational content and clue, and I think people are hungry for knowledge and really scientific, valid, high-quality information. And we need to learn something new all the time. Yeah. Well, and I think just to echo that, actually in biosensing, right? So Rock Health actually um, submitted a report that just in 2015, there was about $4.5 billion invested in, in digital health. And about a quarter of that was biosensing, these apps that actually give you some insights around you know, fertility or period tracking, uh, women's health in general. And I think that that's actually very encouraging to know that the drop-off rate for wearables in general are about, what, I think is 50%, right? Yeah, that's actually my point, is yeah. that a lot, of, a lot of these fitness wearables or fitness apps apps actually have this huge drop-off yeah. rate. People don't want to use it again once they've learned a few insights. Yeah. But I think if you're, if you're tracking something, for example, with Naya, right? If we are tracking something uh, that has to do directly with the child's health and development and wellness, I think that you're dealing with a different motivation, right? So I think, you know, tracking things for yourself, especially I think for women's health, I think we're very hungry for data. We want to understand how to take care of ourselves, especially if we're kind of gearing up to have a baby, right? And so I think that there's just a different motivation there and then it's actionable too in most ways here's i mean speaking of that i'm speaking of that you have a, a slightly different issue here in that right. once you're done pumping i mean mm -hmm. like and to be fair you know you have figured out a monetization plan but your your breast pump is very expensive compared to what else is out there it's about almost six hundred dollars 
Right. Which the average breast pump, electrical breast pump, is about 150. It's about 200 to 300 dollars, and I think that if you compare our system, because we're at the first fully integrated breast pump system that uses water, so we're more comfortable, we're quiet, we're connected, so you're getting that insight. And then beyond that, we're also hospital grade, right? So hospital grade pumps, in on average, are anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500. So we're priced right in the middle of that pricing ladder. And so I think that creating a little a bit more accessible opportunity, I think, for women is really important, and having that hospital grade feature is huge. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, in the future of providing low-cost models, that's absolutely something that's in the pipeline, but I think we really wanted to go out with a system that women were hungry for and really asking for the feature sets that we had. And, and then to be honest, when you're a startup and you're building a, a product, early days, it's pricey to build hardware, and then we have all the connectivity that goes in with it. Right, and so, if, you look at, if you look at Amazon, you right. know, the average that I looked, at least that I saw on there was about 150 for electrical mm -hmm. uh, pumps, kind of similar to yours, but you know, you're offering something a little bit different. How do you get women to make that large jump? I mean, that's a $450 that's difference. A, it's a good question, and I think that you know, for us, it's really clearly defining what the benefit is, right? So pumps, so I have three kids, I pump for all of them, Pumps hurt like hell. Deborah is pumping right now. Um, it's just really uncomfortable. We don't get the insights. Um, it's not efficient. Our system is efficient. And actually what we've been able to prove is that women who actually found increase in performance found that they expressed 29% more milk in the same amount of time than market leading brands. And so I think it just depends on how you're marketing the value, right? And then I think in the long term play for Naya is really biosensing, getting to know what's in that breast milk, making personalized recommendations for both mom and baby in terms of nutritional supplements, really helping those babies to thrive in the NICU, helping to understand how to fortify that breast milk. So I think, to your point, how do you create that longer term relationship and not just sell your breast pump and be done, right? It's the bottle, it's other products that we have in the pipeline for women's health, but we're really starting with mom and baby because we feel like that is actually one of the most urgent needs right now in the marketplace. I will also second that as a new pumping mom that there is no right. piece of equipment. Right, new mom here. There, yeah, I have yeah. a four month old. There is no piece of equipment in my life that is higher stakes right now than a breast pump. And my willingness to pay for something that doesn't break, that's more comfortable, that's quiet, that's portable is high. Every single woman that I've talked to that has ever uh, pumped has said that they want a better breast pump. They, they've told me that it's awful. They've told me it's loud. It's embarrassing. You're taking it to work with you. People are wondering what that noise is. It's cumbersome. I yeah. literally just had my third breast pump break on a, on a cross-country flight this week. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a nightmare what's out there today. It, it's ripe for innovation. I absolutely think that. And then with the Affordable Care Act, too, in January 2013, uh, insurance or private payers are now mandated to cover breast pumps. And so I think the accessibility is growing. Uh, and then there's the continuum of care there. So there's an incentive, if you think about it, for women to provide breast milk for a longer period of time uh, to actually get a good pump. And I think their employers should be incentivized to help them with that because that means that there's less insurance claims, they're not missing work as much because their babies are presumably healthier because they're being exposed to more breast milk. I mean, I think that the, the opportunity, like Deborah was saying, is really ripe for innovation. And, but delivering something that women are, are willing to pay for, so that comes back to your point of just really clearly outlining what are you getting in return for this purchase? Because it is an investment in your child's uh, health future. And you're also FDA approved. We are, we just received FDA clearance. Um, we are considered a class two medical device. That is actually the pump. Our bottle, our smart and connected bottle that actually works with our pump or without is a consumer product and no regulations there. Yeah. And the the two of you, it might not make sense for you to get FDA approval at all, but um, if you're ever interested in giving out advice or, or creating a wearable, you might, have you looked into yeah. getting FDA yeah. approval? We're going that way. I think we're going that way. And I think it's good that these markets are becoming regulated because so, can we talk a, a moment about data security and privacy? Let's talk about yeah. data security it's and privacy. It's not the world's most sexy sure. subject, but yeah. um, I think it's a big deal. Like, people are trusting us with really intimate data, and I think companies like mine need to have a really high ethical bar for what you do with that data. That is not market standard at the moment. I think it should be. And I think having laws will help us you, with that. You, and in Europe, we're trying to get some. <laughs> you just, will you just introduce something uh, that lets your users share their information with their yes. friends or their partners? Yes. Uh, so that's going to be extremely important. Yes. So one of the things that women told us that they really wanted was the ability to share this very intimate data, or some of it, that kind of the headlines with their partners typically. It can also be a mom, 
uh, knowing what's going on for a daughter or two good friends. So we launched a feature called Clue Connect last week, yay, um, <laughs> uh, which enables a woman to share this data with somebody. And I think the key here is that a lot of men, they actually also want to know what's going on mm -hmm. in their dear one's lives. Yeah, um, and I think that's great because I think that helps uh, helps us communicate about sexual health and reproductive health and kind of the health that goes on every day actually in our lives. Because the thing is, it's not just about periods; it's about how do I feel, pain, mood, sex drive, hair, skin, all kind of things, and the big life decisions. Let's talk about some of those insights that you're you're gathering on your app. Actually, just describe what you're doing mm -hmm. to bring in that data to dispel some of these, I mean, there are some crazy myths out there about ovulation and cycles, like, you know. Yeah, so we, we try to be really, really scientific. One of the things we looked at recently was the thing about moon cycles, because you know, there's that kind of this myth that, that women follow the moon, <laughs> and we couldn't see that in the data, sorry. <laughs> That's so, not a thing. Um, so we tried to like debunk myths as well, mm -hmm. and figure out What's actually going on? I mean, there's crazy stuff on the internet. Like, if you, if you Google, like, you know, your ovulation cycle or how to have a baby or whatever, it's like there's... Don't do that. Or no, the I'm gender of the baby, right? <laughs> <laughs> or the, or the, to get the gender of yeah. the baby. It's like, eat watermelon seeds upside yeah. down at midnight. <laughs> and yeah. it's just insane. It's that insane. <laughs> yeah. And you, I mean, you, you probably know a little, you've probably seen some... In, in fact, you have a few studies out on yes. how effective um, certain careers are in and getting a baby through IVF. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's, it's been interesting just kind of sifting through, through all of the data that we have and gathering, I mean, you know, the, the most helpful insights, which are things like, you know, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, we've seen do better at an academic medical institution. Like, when they learn that they might have PCOS from you, they might be looking for a doctor, and that's like a great And you can see that they have PCOS. We were talking about this earlier, yeah. but you can't tell them because it's not FDA approved. We can tell them that we, have, that we can see patterns that look uh -huh. like this and then encourage them to go see a doctor. You can't but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's a little bit gray area, and that's one of the reasons why we want to get certified so that we can do it with, like, without, yeah. yeah. Right. And it's sensitive, like, you've got to be so careful. Like, how do you get this across to the woman so she doesn't open this app and she's like, or an email and be like, what's going on with me? Like, it's, you got to, this is a trust industry. You've got to get that right. 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 You guys, we're almost out of time, but I do want to ask each of you, uh, right before we end, there's so much coming down the line in this this uh, this new kind of this women's health tech industry. What do you want to see in the next five to ten years? What do you hope? So my hope is that we have one marketplace where there are trusted brands where women can go to and get their answers, whether they're looking for education, if they're looking for reliable and safe products, um, or just... Not a Yahoo Answers. Yeah, exactly. We're coming from thought leaders, right? Or service providers, being able to provide service, which is something that Naya wants to do eventually. Um, we just... You know, we're busy women, and we don't have a lot of time to surf the internet, even though we do. Uh, we want that one-stop shop, and I think that's what creates a tremendous opportunity for women's health and then actually caring for your family. And that's why I think it's so exciting to be here with Ida and Deborah because I think that we can all work synergistically to create this one marketplace, which is a huge multi-billion dollar opportunity. Yeah, and what right. do you think? I mean, I echo that. I just think I would love to see more resources being poured into truly authoritative data right. and insights so that women aren't um, just surfing around in the middle of the night looking at really scary chat rooms, seeing that, you know, if you eat pineapple, maybe you'll have a <laughs> successful IVF cycle. Right. Um, yeah. I, th I think we have a long way to go. I'm, so I'm hearing from all of you, and I'm sure you would agree, that basically we just need some scientific research around this. Yeah. 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 Working it. But we need one more thing. I think there's a whole term that we need to coin. I think we should call it femtech for for technology that's addressing female health. There is so much happening, and yeah. we need a name for it. Let's call it Femtech. That is all the time we have, you guys. You have been great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you.